Okay, I think we're gonna get started. We'll let people come in as they will. My name is Erica Wall and I am director of the Berkshire Cultural Resource Center here at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. And I have the pleasure today of introducing our Gallery 51 featured artist, Anina Major. And uh, we are gonna spend about the next 60 minutes, which usually goes by really quickly, to find out a little bit more about her. Um, we usually skip all of the bios who can spend most of the time talking with her. All of her information is on our website at Gallery 51. And um, today we're just gonna find out a little bit about what Anina's up to. And Anina and I go a little ways back. So Anina and I actually met through a residency that, um, that I run here in uh, North Adams. But she also had a show before I got here at Gallery 51. So it is, uh, it is an especially nice opportunity to get to talk with Anina today with everyone else. So welcome, Anina. Hey. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and thanks, for, thanks for being with us. You know, it's, I have to say it hasn't been a while since we've talked because we keep <laughs> No, so it's yeah. just a nice opportunity to let everybody else participate in the yeah. in the conversation. But how we usually start this all off, I love that you're in your studio space because this is uh -huh. for a, a yeah, I got the best light today. Got the best exactly. Light. <laughs> the lighting is lovely. It looks perfect. Um, I am going to start off with tell us where we're talking to you. Where are you talking to us from? Uh, today I am in Providence, Rhode Island on Rhode Island School of Design and Ceramics Department uh, studio space. That is where I am today. <laughs> great, great. And so tell us a little bit about what you're up to. You're going to be teaching in the, in the fall? Yes, I am going to be teaching in the fall and I also am participating in uh, Elizabeth Foundation of the Arts studio program in New York. So there is a bit of a transition that's happening. Um, and we're moving at a weird pace due to COVID. I, you know, where am I at any given moment seems to always change. Right, right. Yes. So, you know, what, why don't you start off? Um, we usually ask, ask our artists to share with us a little bit about their practice. For someone that knows nothing about your work or what you do, could you just share with us um, your medium and, and how your practice works? <clears throat> Well, I work primarily with clay, um, but I'm always looking, I think, overarching. Somebody asked me a little while ago, like, well, what is it that I do or what is it that I make? And I feel as though I make space for narratives that I know about that I don't see being shared in a larger platform. So I do that through many ways. At the moment, I feel like it's through the objects that I make. Um, not just in the objects themselves after they've been created, but just in the process of actually making them. Um, and then what happens to them afterwards and giving them a life of their own, essentially. And that's primarily through clay. And mm -hmm. I build in a specific way. I've been focused on weaving, which is known as plaiting in the Bahamas. It is a technique that's used to make a variety of objects from dolls to straw baskets. And my way of engaging with that practice is in one paying homage to my own direct lineage, but also looking for a kind of coded language that I use to talk about these narratives that I think that I'm making you know, that I'm telling. So, yeah. So, tell us, how long have you been practicing? And tell us a little bit about your journey. I think I've been practicing all of my life. <laughs> it's a practice. It's a right. verb, right? Um, right? But I guess I would say, like, professionally would be once I graduated from grad school, um, or even the decision to go to grad school in 2015 would have been the start of actually being professionally practicing even though I have been practicing, I think, and making mm -hmm. all of my life. Um, I don't know, sometimes I think my journey is not that common, but I feel like it is now, because I've met so many people that kind of, you know, you 
at that point where you're like, what do you want to do with your life? And um, you start, and if you're a creative person, there is this lean to being an artist. And I knew very, at a very young age that I wanted to be an artist. Like, not even that I wanted to be an artist, that I was an artist. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really, re like my earliest memory is probably at like five or six, like being taught how to paint from my father. Um, so I, I think I always knew that that was something that was gonna run in my veins. I don't think growing up in the Bahamas, I really knew the vastness that the word artist means. I think I had, uh, at the time, just growing up, for me, that was like, oh, you paint, that's it. <laughs> so um, I think that kind of put me in a position where I thought I wanted to be a painter. And so I started painting, and I think a lot of people have entry into the arts via painting. Uh, I did some print, and then I started doing a little bit of printmaking. I was fortunate to participate in this summer program for teens where uh, artists who, professional Bahamian artists who went off to school and came back were teaching summer classes at the local college, and I learned about printmaking then, and then I I think that might have been my first introduction to contemporary art. And from there, I really enjoyed it, just threw myself into it. Uh, by the time it was time to go to college, I had this conversation with the parents, and the parents were like, we don't really know how that works. <laughs> um, and they actually, you know, like very practically, we did some legit research. I mean, they set up meetings for me to meet with some of the prominent artists in the Bahamas at the time, Antonius Roberts, um, Stan Burnside. And I had sit downs with them, um, which in hindsight, I realized was really kind of special because a lot of the young artists that I'm talking to now didn't have those opportunities. Uh, Stan is no longer with us. Um, so being able to like meet these people very young in my life and them explain to me like what what their experience was as becoming an artist, leaving the country, going to school, studying abroad, what that meant, um, and and kind of giving me an inkling of like what my life would be like. Um, so yeah, so it was good. And then at the time, I I thought, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. But this idea of being practical is something that's really important to me and it's really important I think to just anyone that you know when you can go back in your own family lineage and see that your grandmother right didn't graduate from high school you know they left primary school to to work this idea of picking a practical career path that will be sustainable financially becomes a measurement of success, right? It becomes something that is valued and to be admired. Mm -hmm. So again, didn't know much, right? So didn't know how I could practically make this thing that I enjoy doing into something that would also fit the criteria and make my family proud, um, I learned ways to compromise that. And so when I did come off, when I did leave home to um, study abroad, I went to Philadelphia and I studied graphic design at Drexel University. And that was, a great experience. I mean, just even the experience of no longer living in a small, isolated place, back to a big to a big city. Um, but I never left the concept of using my hand. So that was the time where we did graphic design. Everything's computer, right? But I always somehow had elements of my work that brought in my hand. And I always had elements in my work that were telling stories that I wish I had known earlier. So like, you know, poetry was like a thing. I did my first like layout, magazine layouts on Gwendolyn Brooks and her poems. Um, I was big on like actually incorporating my hand. I also had a strong sense of what audience I wanted to speak to. Like my graduation project was kind of like a recipe book 
for Bahamian culinary arts. And it had, it was like a book and it was like all these cards, but it also incorporated the history of these recipes and how they were brought through different groups of people that came and settled in the country. Um, the names behind this, the colloquial language, um, and then all of the culture and stories that surrounded it. So in a way, I've always been interested in bringing something that I don't see in a larger kind of discourse into the discourse and realizing that there are a lot of similarities um, and parallels within these kind of conversations. So it doesn't, it's so in hindsight, it doesn't surprise me that I'm now working with my hands and working with clay. Uh, I went on to work in graphic design and did corporate marketing. And at the time in Philadelphia, there, there were um, a lot of, I think they're still there. I think Fleischer, Fleischer is still there. Um, the clay studio, of course, is still there. And um, I started taking these pottery classes with a couple, Neil, Neil Patterson and Sandy Parentosi. And I went to their class every Wednesday night. And then I started going every Thursday night. I started taking two classes. And it was mainly because I liked the energy. I liked the group of people. It was a nice contrast to what I was doing corporately. My hands were getting dirty. Initially, that was not a thing. But <laughs> I got over it. Um, and... You know, it, I think it was Sandy. One day I came and I spoke to Sandy and I said, you know, I, I think I want to do something like this, you know. And Sandy had also studied graphic design, but in a time where everything was cut by hand. And she, and she kind of just was like, you can do this. I know you can. And that's when she really kind of put it in perspective for me about what type of sacrifices I might have to make. Uh, and again, these were like now things that I had associated with this concept of financial security, right? Like you pay your own bills, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're able to help your family out and so forth. And so that kind of like was like, oh, hold on. We having this conversation again? And so again, I'm having this conversation maybe about, I'm trying to count the years, maybe 10 years later from like graduating from high school. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> I really don't. But I'm going to open myself up to that opportunity. So I started applying to jury shows. And um, like one of the first jury shows I got in, it was like PA uh, state art show. And my piece won like second prize or something, I think. Maybe second or third prize. And I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. So maybe I, <laughs> maybe I do <laughs> know how to do something here. Let me give it a shot, okay? So I had this kind of like, you know, encouragement in different ways to keep moving. And um, when my job said, hey, we have an opening in New York, um, an account that I had been working on, they were like, so you want to go to New York? And I was like, not really. I mean, my dog is great. My place is great. I've got this wonderful group that I meet with on Wednesdays and Thursdays. I have this life in Philly. No, I don't want to go <laughs> to New York. <laughs> and um, so I ended up going because like the client was, you know, <laughs> putting the pressure on for me to come. And, and I ended up moving to New York through a series of events um, that have nothing to do with art. Mm -hmm. But I knew once I got there that I needed to hold on to the same energy that I had kind of like found for myself in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So a mutual friend of mine was like, yo, we gotta, there's a building over here that says it's renting artist studios. Do you want to go over? And I'm like, I can't afford no artist studio. <laughs> I was like, that's not how I work. Because before I had like this nice little shared space, actually, I had a, um, out of the ceramic shop in Philadelphia. I worked out of his space for a while. And I was just like, no, I got this little shared space. I definitely can't even imagine affording a studio of my own. That's ridiculous. Okay. Let me go. Let me go. Because I'm always, I'm curious. And so I was like, let me go and see what these studios cost. Because I mean, I already just started paying rent in an apartment. And I know what that costs. So I can't even imagine this space. Right. And, um, it was just kind of like a really 
special story because I walked in and the guy's like, yeah, we got these studios. And he's like, what do you want? And I was like, again, I don't know what I want. <laughs> I don't know what I want. So I just kind of like casually was like, well, what, what do you got? Let me see what you got. Tell me what you have and how much it costs. And so he starts taking me through this, these spaces. And, um, you know, he's telling me the prices. And I'm going, noted. Cannot afford that. <laughs> but noted, cannot afford that now. But maybe able to afford that one day. Let's, you know, goals. So he, um, but he comes to this last space. And then I have to say that this building is like, there's only one build. It's like a block up from my apartment, and so it, there's only one building in between. And technically, you could kind of see through the like courtyard space of the building that it's next to. And so you can see my apartment building that I live in. So he takes me to this space, and it's got this wall of windows, and I can kind of see. And I'm like, oh, that's nice, and I'm really liking this space because it has a sink. Not all the spaces had sinks. So I'm like, oh, this is kind of nice. Okay, I know I like this space. And I, I remember having the conversation in my head, like, whatever number he's saying, Nina, that's your next financial goal. So <laughs> he says this number and I was like, hold on, what? <laughs> I thought he made a mistake. But you know, in true fashion, I was like, clearly this space is for me. He didn't make a mistake. <laughs> so I signed the lease that day. Man, no plan. No plan. <laughs> just don't know how to put work in this space. Nah. So I like leave and I'm like walking home, which is only a block. And I'm like, girl, where you gonna get that money from? <laughs> just like, we gotta move some stuff around. So I came back and called my friend and I'm like, I'm selling my car. <laughs> now all these sacrifices were already like foreshadowed by Sandy in Philadelphia. She told me, she was like, you're gonna get rid of that fancy car girl and you're gonna get rid of that apartment and you're gonna get rid of all this stuff that you like. And I was like, I don't see that happening, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> and here I am like fast forward, like two years later, I'm like, yeah, this car got to go. We got rid of that car within two weeks. It was gone. One, like three bills eradicated immediately. Didn't even think twice. Wasn't even bothered by it because I had this space. Like I just was like, yeah, not a problem. Gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that move really like catapulted everything else, mm -hmm. right? Like I still didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. I was like making these pots and I thought maybe I wanted to be a designer. Um, I just didn't know. Right. But the point of the matter is that I was in the right place, right? Because mm -hmm. I had some pretty nice neighbors. <laughs> I was in a building surrounded by a lot of black artists, you know, some mm -hmm. who are pretty established right now and have been practicing for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I think I was in the space where I was supposed to be, just like I said, that studio was made for me and was the point for me. Mm -hmm. So within that space, I met a lot of other artists who invited me to different events and to different openings. Um, I basically schooled me in a way, like they were like these little earth angels that would like send me these, I'm on my way to work on the subway and I'll get a text message like, did you read this in the New York Times? Like, and it's just like, no, I did not. <laughs> you know? But I was like open to it. And one day, uh, one of those artists came into my studio and was like, so, um, well, actually, so we had an open studio and my mentor at my job actually said, you should participate in this open studio. And I was like, I am not an artist, okay? Like I make stuff. But I don't know. And she's like, no, you should participate. And I was like, oh, great. So I like put together my best effort and you know put my little stuff out on the table. And it's so cute now that I think about it because these pieces are like this big and I have like this huge table in the center of the studio. And I'm, you know, artist walks. So it's a Harlem artist walk and people are like coming in and they're asking you questions about your mm -hmm. work. And, and I'm just like, mm, this is interesting. And, um, so, so yeah, I was 
going along with the flow. People are saying, do it, do it. So an artist friend came to me and said, so uh, when are you going to apply to go to grad school? And I was like, never. <laughs> nope, that's not in my cards. That's not something. Because mm -mm. again, here's what I thought, guys. I wasn't thinking art school, great opportunity to meet other people, make more stuff, grow in my practice. What I was thinking was, who will pay these student loans? Like, I'm still paying student loans. I also had been doing like MB, my MBA a couple years ago, and I was like, I'm done with school. Like, I really am not, that's not my path. Like, I, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then, I guess, after just, being in New York for about two years, you know, experiencing and actually meeting what I was looking for many, many years ago when I was a teen, actually meeting other working artists mm -hmm. made a difference. It absolutely made a difference. I started to physically see how these people existed in the world and was able to make the assessment for myself, like, could I exist in that way? Mm -hmm. um, and so then I started looking into it. It was that simple. I just kind of was like, okay, now I see that this is not an imaginary thing. I see how vast this could be. I see what that life is. I have examples of it. I have friends that actually live it. And the question is, do I think I could live that life? Am I willing to make that kind of change? I want to say yes, because, you know, the next conversation I had with my friend when they were like, okay, so you ready to apply? And I was like, no, I don't want to do it that way. And they were like, why not? And I was like, because I just am struggling with this idea of you saying that I should put myself in a position that's very um, volatile compared to like what I, my value system is based on and what is so important. And you know, they were like, well, that's very selfish of you. And I was like, whoa, that's a hurtful thing to say to me. I would never think that I'm a selfish person. But I just like thought about it. And really what he was saying was that if I continue to not put my, myself and my work out there for someone to see, that's a younger me, then how will I ever, how will we ever get past this idea that like, you can't do that? Like there needs to be like tons of examples of how you could navigate, navigate this industry that, or this space that we call art or creativity. And the less there are of us, because we think we need to, you know, acquire things, then how do we stop the cycle, right? Are, are we just repeating something by doing that? And I think that's what really changed for me. Like this idea, like, again, I want to tell these narratives, but again, if you're not constantly trying to expand that platform and who you tell these narratives to, then how are you really having any impact on, the, on someone that you're trying to encourage or like the, the younger you that needed that encouragement or needed that point of reference, right? Like, how do I change that? So that's how I got here. And then at that moment, when I decided that I was going to go to grad school, it was like, we never had these thoughts about, you know, but what am I giving up? Like, I kind of left that behind. Like, it was like, this isn't about that anymore. Like, this is about moving forward and making sure that you know, when we talk about how many artists that are black that work with clay, we don't got to use two hands. We could use two hands, two feet, like everything, pull out furniture, like, you know, whatever we need to do, that is so much that we can't even count. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, that's like the goal. But if we are constantly being held to some other things, then that might become difficult. The one saying it's easy, because that's, never the top that's not what we're talking about we're just talking about the actual act of doing mm -hmm. and what does that mean mm -hmm. so yeah that's kind of like my story in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> that's how i got here yeah that's it <laughs> now you know i i well obviously anina and i 
talk about these things a lot outside of this. And I think what she's just described is one of the reasons why we, um, I think why we, we talk so much and why we have worked together. But um, your story is a perfect example of what we try to do um, for all artists, but I think specifically for artists who come from historically underrepresented groups and primarily African American black artists, the idea that we are looking at providing a broader representation of what exists, what you explained, if you don't see it, you don't believe that it can be done, but the acknowledgement that the way in which we navigate it will not be the same for everyone. You know, one of the things with your, with your journey, which I think is so exemplary, it is the acknowledgement that there is a practical sense of how to navigate this that most people assume artists don't consider. Yeah. You're starving, you don't, you don't, you don't have the sense to prioritize those things because you're so passionate about your work and that is not true. Yeah. Understanding that there is a strategy to it and absolutely it is not for the faint of heart. But I think that, you know, the illusion that it, as you said, well, you have to give that all up. No, I think you have made such a beautiful um, kind of, I think just a beautiful map of how it actually transitioned from this idea of a, of a career that would sustain you, yeah. you thought of that first, and then creating a career based on what you had done that will sustain you and your practice. Like this, this transition through, you know, doing your graphic design work, the transition from Pennsylvania to New York, to now teaching and doing, I mean, that is part of it. And the idea that it is a marathon and not a sprint have that conversation a lot like what does that mean especially when you're in grad school and in circles with artists who do navigate it differently yeah and yeah and there's so many different ways of navigating it right. no one way is better than the other if you're not right you know right uh i think what i encourage everyone to do is that we all have skill sets okay we all have them and I encourage people to lean into their skill sets, to learn more skill sets, right? And use them. Right. You know, I mean, that's what it is. Like, I'm just using the skill sets that I have already done the work to learn. Right? Right. My priorities are always my artwork. Right. Right? Like, that's the commitment that I'm actually making. I'm saying that, like, my priority is the artwork. And when I make decisions about my life, trust me, everyone is a scale where I'm like, well, what does this do to the artwork? How long will that affect the artwork? Will that be something that pushes the artwork more towards what I want? That's, that's constant for me. Um, right. Yeah, I kind of don't make any decisions without keeping that in mind. Yeah, but I think also we've had conversations about understanding and recognizing your own individual threshold. Yeah. Pretend like you can do it this way because yeah. you've seen other, if, it, if you need to do it a certain way, that's how you do it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. some people like yourself can take all 24 hours in a day, do your work and your practice where others take the 12 to, you know, yeah. it's, but it's, yeah. but I, I think that you acknowledge that there is a certain threshold in terms of your, your um, quality of life, the way in which yeah live, what you can do. And I think that everyone needs to acknowledge that in order to sustain the practice, yeah, because yeah. you talked about that. If you burn yeah. out or you don't have the support system or the network or don't know, um, you know, all the things that we, that our counterparts know <clears throat> that we don't, that puts us at a disadvantage. It takes all of that energy to actually do what you need to do to get to that place yeah, yeah. and how do we how do we um yeah. really manage that yeah and you know i talk about those earth angels and mm -hmm. like you know we don't speak that often anymore but it's really funny because i spoke to one of them a couple months ago and they were like i was wondering when we were going to talk again it's so good you know artists should just ask more artists <laughs> i was like noted and it's yeah. true like i don't think we probably talk to each other enough there's too much to do because unfortunately I think there is a perception that there are only so many spaces as you described, especially yeah. when it comes for, for certain kinds 
of artists from different backgrounds that represent certain things. And I think, you know, we're definitely in a place where we're looking at a shift right now, but again, sustaining that shift so that we can broaden the representation still has not, still is the same challenge. Yeah. You know, it is not just the, the desire to go to grad school. It's not even just finishing grad school. It's what happens after that, that yeah. we argue takes even more energy to sustain. Yeah. Um, oh, definitely. Right? Definitely. Most definitely. <laughs> I wonder if, you know, can you, can you talk a little bit about maybe like in terms of where you are and what you're doing now? with your practice, the residency right. teaching, like, you know, I always have this discussion, especially with black artists and artists of color, this idea of <clears throat> life and practice and the hustle, right? right? The hustle looks different for different people. Agreed. So what am how, I? Yeah, how's yours looking right now? How's mine looking right now? How's your hustle, girl? Girl, anyway. So like, I mean, like, so, okay, so grad school happened, right? And I think I made this commitment to do a residency tour, <laughs> mm -hmm. which meant that I was going to be hopping around for residencies. And I kind of like really made that very clear to everyone around me. Like, I'm about to do a residency tour. Like, <laughs> don't be looking for me to be one place for a long, you know, for different periods of time. And I understood why I was doing that. Like, I didn't just set out like on this endless thing it was kind of like I want to do this residency tour because I'm graduating from grad school and I can't afford to build the facilities the way that I may want you know mm -hmm. like I have a long-term idea of what this means for me right and I had that kind of idea prior to grad school so right now I'm coming at the end of the three-year residency tour which was like the max and I'm like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> so I'm now transitioning into something. I'm looking to transition into something that's more stable. Not saying I won't do residencies again. Just saying that it won't. It will be like residencies will change meaning for me. Maybe there'll be a break from my actual like homestead or you know something like that. Like to switch it up. But this idea of like using residencies. The period of time where I needed to use residencies as a necessity to build my practice or like my network. I think mm -hmm. I, I think I'm that is a pause right now. Now I want to okay. focus on um, actually building a space for myself mm -hmm. that I can come back to. And it's kind of ironic that it's happening all around COVID time and like this idea where people want to be closer to their loved ones or. Um, just have the comfort of knowing, of having the stability of a home. It's, it's really, it's like ironic that that's actually happening at the same time for me. Um, so that, that's what really I'm looking at. But I would say, I always knew that this residency wasn't going to be forever for me. Like I, I just, I knew that. Um, I would say now I, and it always was about kind of figuring out where is going to be the base. Um, and then I was good doing the residencies, different places, uh, furthest west is Rochester and then, you know, up and down in New England area, really kind of solidified like, well, where is that place going to be? And like, what kind of resources that I have at my disposal um, in order to do that? And what does that look like and what does that home base look like and approaching it in a very like phased way right I know we've talked about this in detail about if this is my life work let's just say that very loaded statement if it is my life work then how does that life evolve and how do I always make sure that every day I contribute towards that you know I'm a matri maker of objects I am always going to have need have a necessity for space. Space is going to be a thing for me. I knew that coming into grad school. Space is going to be a thing, Anina. Like, you make objects. So just know that just like health insurance, you gonna always need space. You're not going to need space to store something. Um, that's not a surprise. And so how do I maintain a space? For me, that's really thinking through, like, how do I keep that going? And, 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 and if I'm going to do that, is ownership the route that I need to go? I mean, the reality is that I 
I might not have a place to lay my head and my family and friends will let me stay with them, but I don't know if they'll let me bring all my work. <laughs> I always think about that. Like, I don't know if my aunt's gonna let me bring all my work or my mom would let me do it, you know? This, that's a real conversation. Like, right, right. you don't want your clay stuff in the living room. So <laughs> if this is my life's work, I can't be treating my life's work like that. I can't be like, dude, I need to put you in the trash right now. Or let me, you know, I need to make sure that I understand the importance of that. And I invest in my work the same way that I'd want somebody else to invest in it. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's a value. It's my life's work. So I kind of been thinking about that a lot and how to secure that for myself. And this is mm -hmm. outside of like a market concept, right? This is not like, oh, you're, this is like securing the space so that like I could, you know, be in the market. No, this is securing the space so that my work give I give my work the due respect and value that I think it has. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about that. I mean, one of the reasons, you know, we we kind of found each other in New England here is that idea of setting up an HQ as an artist. What does that look like? What does that mean? And is it always the best idea for it to be in a major metropolitan art centered city? Yeah. For a certain part of your career, maybe, but at the end of the day, what does it really require in assessing that? But also this idea that, you know, what what you've described is again for the long haul. What yeah. does that really look like? And how how do we how do we create that for ourselves? But I really love, I appreciate that you um, kind of shared with us that idea of this kind of residency tour. Yeah. Because that was kind of how, again, um, one of the realizations I had about artists, specifically after leaving the MFA programs, that they are losing their cohort, they're losing their mentors, they're losing that feedback that you get from the ominous crit that takes place on a regular basis. And how do you feed your practice without that? And residencies are one way to do it. But we're also realizing that it is not easy, as you and I both know, to up root yourself every so often, sometimes a month, sometimes a couple of weeks, sometimes a lot. It's very, it's not an easy thing when you are producing work. And we know that there are artists who are in residency to be able to produce work because they cannot afford yeah. regular space. Exactly. Their work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I mean, I fell into that category straight out of school. Like, I can't mm -hmm. afford this space to do any work. Right. Um, I will say that, like, I, I, I think that like, it's not so much that you lose access or like you lose this kind of thing. I think it changes. I think what happens is it's not so much that you lose it, it changes, it transforms. So you're still seeking the critique, you're still think, seeking the community, but it's not that you've lost it. It kind of takes on a different ether, like body. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's now you have, it's not coincidental mm -hmm. anymore. You know, it's like a no brainer. I have class on Wednesday, it's crit. All the people in my class are gonna be there. Now it's a little different. Now it's like, how do I maintain the relationships that I had when I was in grad school going into life when we don't see each other every week? Like, is that a text message? And you know, how does that work for me? And right. You know, it, it's about those relationships and like the relationship with your advisor changes as well. You know, mm -hmm. you're now, you're now out. And like, so what does that relationship look like? It evolves into something else. But this idea that it's not necessarily that you lose it. It's that the way that it's nurtured changes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Like how you maintain that is non-circumstantial anymore. It right. is a it's a conscious like effort to maintain and nurture that relationship which i also think is important too i mean the biggest benefit of being in an academic institution one of the biggest benefits i think is so that you don't have to worry about that logistical aspect of any career or you know like you're put in an environment that provides the facilities and takes care of all of the logistics so that you can focus on what actually you want, right? Like, and it doesn't matter what major we're talking about, even outside of the arts, right? 
but mm -hmm. you're put in an environment where everything is provided for a reason so that you could concentrate on the creativity, right? And that's what, if you're utilizing it well, will lead to the growth in your knowledge base, right? Like, I think my work has grown exponentially since I went to grad school for a person who didn't want to go. Like, I don't know what Anina was thinking because Anina pre-grad school was, I would never return to that artist, whoever that was. That, I mean, I returned conceptually to revisit ideas, but as far as like skill set wise or like knowledge base or even concept of um, how far this could go, no, she wasn't ready. She wasn't mm -hmm. ready, you know, like mm -hmm. the exposure. So I think it allows you to open your brain in that way, tap into mm -hmm. the area. Um, and then afterwards, those things that it was providing you before, you need to figure out how you can still nurture those relationships and take them into this new chapter, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I understood that graduating. I'm just understanding that now, like three years out. So don't. So don't yeah, think I think. That. I think <laughs> also. <laughs> yeah, I think also um, something to to note is that it is very much up to each individual artist to, um, to, to promote and to advance that process you're describing. Yes. It is up to you. At the end of the day, no matter who represents you, no matter, that is up to you. Yeah. And I think we have, and I think you're a perfect example of that, but, you know, I think probably both of us, I'm sure there are artists that, that you teach or, or mentor, and, and I do too, this idea of, um, you know, give me the script. How do I do this? How do I, and a lot of artists, it is, it is it's, a, it's a process that develops, but it is a commitment to, even when I don't feel like it, I have to put myself out there. I have, like, sustaining that sort of network that you're talking about. Yeah. promoting yourself and having those conversations and making yourself heard and showing your work all of those at the end of the day are your responsibility and even when you have representation it is still your responsibility to manage and negotiate your space it is yeah. never something that you hand over to someone else and i think yeah. that's really important yeah 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 you know that's very that's, yeah what okay so before we go what are you working on <laughs> what's in your studio what's your everything <laughs> everything i'm working on everything um well i mean whew, what am i working on you know summers were supposed to be rest for me just putting that out there so it's been actually kind of weird to still be making stuff yeah. um these months i usually i i had established that summers were going to be my uh rejuvenation period and the part where I do a lot of field research and I reconnect with my family who's like where are you in the world <laughs> um, but that again has changed with COVID and so I've kind of been working just kind of like to maintain some kind of normalcy uh right now specifically well last week I did a soda was that last week week before last I was asking Joe but week before last we did a soda firing I'm just kind of in a place where I'm making and thinking about my practice, thinking about the firing process has been something that's been at the top of my brain right now. And what does that symbolically mean um, within my work? Um, and then, you know, engagements aside, like I have people who are asking to participate in shows and whatnot, but from a like studio practice, I think, I have been focusing on not just the act of making, but what does this kiln environment really mean for me? And what does it mean for my work to change physically and chemically when it enters this space? And mm -hmm. how can I manipulate this space mm -hmm. to symbolize a process or a history with an object, um, you know, that, I don't know, that we don't, maybe not, not talk about, you know, like, what does it mean for me, Anina, 
a woman of color from another country in living this life and who do I pay homage to and and just how that incubator of a kiln contributes to the object mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and and you know it's extreme heat and what does that mean what does heat and fire mean for me and all the things that I'm processing right now like what right. how does that add to that dialogue um yeah what does that mean and yeah. like how does that contribute to a sense of sus sustainability what ritual is that that I continuously engage in um, when I make these works. I mean, right. we know it's already ritualistic in the fact that I'm weaving and actually creating form in a way that um, is generational, you know, and in, and in a way indigenous. But what does it mean when I, that material, like engaging with a different material and then how that material changes and the forces that allow it to change. I mean, heat is a pretty intense force. Um, and I and I actually feel like that resonates a lot today, right? We're talking a lot about change and as far as, you know, inclusivity and tolerance and um, actually lifting voices that we have, that have been underrepresented. So what does it mean to kind of see parallels between this process of, you know, of, of firing? And like, what does that heat transformation mean metaphorically? Yeah. And, yeah, and just like researching like just the history of fire and heat in relation to ceremonies and, and what they bring about and what they symbolize. And I think across cultures, anyone can relate to that, that something does happen. Um, and so I've just been thinking about my own ritual, right? That kind of came from my own history that I'm now pushing out into the world and how that could add another layer to an already complex narrative that I'm working through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know um, since we talked, I was really excited about, well, I'm always excited about everything you do, <laughs> but I think that there are a lot of things that you were exploring that were um, very much, you know, about some of the research you're conducting from the video work that you're doing, yeah. kind of exploiting the whole installation idea with your yeah. neon lighting, bringing in, you know, all so many different materials from the sand to all these other parts. And, but it always is so amazing to see how it is integrated into your ceramic work. Yeah. And that how that actually manifests that you're talking about this idea of what actually happens in the kiln. Yeah. And if that's well, I mean, the thing is, like, like, yeah, I mean, the thing is that I'm, I'm transforming materials so that they can have evidence of existence, right? Like transforming the material. And there's so many, like, I just feel like there's so many materials that transform with heat. And so I've just been incorporating them. I mean, recently, mm -hmm the last work incorporated the clams that I clammed in, in Cape Cod at the last residency. And it just made sense uh, to, that I would make a bed of those and fire my pieces in them and, and see what they add to that narrative about that particular work that was made in that particular space, right? Right, right, yeah. So are you, because, yeah, I think that's that's also something that's interesting, too, talking about kind of site specificity, you know, almost that there is something that you're taking from each place. And I even remember, you know, like last summer, a lot of the same discussion about this reflection of space and going back home yeah. for a little bit, which is different from this summer, not yeah. being able to actually go back home. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think all of it, as as it always does, seems to kind of come together and intersect. But again, it always is um, really in an amazing manifestation in your ceramic work. I mean, you showed us kind of some of the different hues, but then this idea of these larger openings in your work and kind of these spaces. But it, I think it, again, it goes back to um, kind of understanding how you always look at it holistically, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
okay yeah these works but it is something in the larger context yeah i mean i kind of i, I again i think that's a part of like my storytelling nature that i want to tell these stories um and so you know within any story good story there are you know a million tangents that we could go off on and and if i got a life time to tell this story that I'm going to go and explore all the tangents that come right. to mind. So, you know, when I first started, it was essentially just about making. And then, you know, but then you ask the questions like any good historian, like why did these people make, uh, what were they making and where did they make them? What was it for? Who took these objects? Where did these objects live now? How did these objects survive? Um, and when I start asking those questions, then it opens up a whole another ball of wax, right? Like right. being from a like country that's centered around tourism, that's you know almost entirely related to your sense of self and identity. Um, so what does that mean? What does this capitalist structure mean for one's understanding of themselves? Mm -hmm. and able articulate that in language before in commercials you know this is why i started why i remade commercials because it was like we were thinking about how these words had meaning and these were words that others had created in order to commercialize not just the land but the people and everything that they made and so what does that do to a person when their existence is contingent upon what products they can produce and how um, viable they are as an object, right? I mean, it, it just keeps going. And as an object maker, like I, I feel obligated to um, explore that. I, I also feel obligated to explore not just what we're making, why we're making it, what does it mean, and does it have value outside of this kind of colonial structure? Um, can can there be true artistry in that, right? right. Um, can that inform the future? Can that talk about things that are happening now? Um, you know, a recent project that I had put in a proposal for really talked about how, you know, at the, at the onset, you couldn't separate the land from the people, right? And so if you can't separate the land from the people, then what happens next? The objects that they're making based on these objects from the land. And if the land is in threat, then how do you not address that, right? Like if now we're seeing more hurricanes, you know, how do we, how do we approach these topics? So I kind of think my, my objects and my installation, even the performance work as part of trying to give a more in-depth and comprehensive understanding of a particular human experience, right? Um, and, and then again, there's my hand in that because I'm an artist and I will make creative decisions. But like, just opening up that narrative of what it means um, and how that keeps moving in a contemporary space and how that keeps changing. So, um... I want to, I, I, we have some folks on here. If anybody has any questions, definitely let us know in chat. We're getting close to the end of our time here as it always happens and goes so quickly. But if you have questions or just wave your hand, if you're on camera, let us know. Um, so out of all of this, you know, there's been so much um, going on. 2020 has been uh, amazing, you know, politically, socially, um, you know, obviously with regard to uh, health, but how has it been, um, how has it been specifically for you? Has it impacted your work or your practice? Um, or has it been kind of, to some people, it has been an opportunity yeah. to take a minute to step back because a lot was postponed or canceled. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've always stepped back during the summer. That's my time to kind of slow down a bit. And I'm always constantly doing a health check on myself emotionally, mentally, mm -hmm. physically. That's a regular. I mean, when you work hard, as, like I work really hard. Like, I mean, I honestly probably work too much. 
So I have to always do these checks every once in a while. Like, are you, uh, are you taking care of yourself? Because that's also important in order to continue this journey. Um, I think from a, from a physical making standpoint, COVID hasn't really affected the way that I still work. I work anywhere. Because my priority is to make this work right mm -hmm. i work anywhere um but emotionally it's been very challenging i would say like it's but i understand that you know change really comes with discomfort i get that and um so emotionally it has been challenging and i'm constantly thinking of how this time is affecting me and how i can not only survive it, but um, help others, you know, how we can support each other, how we can just really continue to understand fully our value. I, I mean, at the root of my practice, the reason I'm so passionate about like the work that I do and having some inkling of where it came from and where I'm from is because I see value in myself and I think that everyone should have value in self mm -hmm. and what does it really mean to value oneself and how when you see another person value themselves how it makes you contemplate the value you have for yourself you know and trying to keep that pushing forward because if we work I think if we work with that in mind that everyone has value and purpose on this earth then some of those decisions we be making, we might not be making them. Mm -hmm. If you value human life, you know? True, true. We've got a question from Jolie. And Jolie, I'm going to unmute you. Hold on, hold on one sec. Let's see. I thought it was unmute just now. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Can you get on mute? Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. got you. Hey, Great talk. <laughs> um, I I didn't know that you went to Drexel for graphic design. Um, but I was wondering if, like, do you feel like um, having that background in graphic design has, like, had any influence on um, your ceramics at all or, like, how you approach ceramics? Huh, that's a good question. I actually, I mean, yes, everything that you do has an influence. I, I don't want to say like, do I think that graphic design directly took me to play? No, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I, um, because I chose graphic design knowing that I wanted to be an artist. And so if anything, graphic design was an opportunity to learn another way of telling a story and expressing myself. Um, so for me, I wouldn't say that it brought me to that, but I will say that I, I learned a lot in it. I mean, I think the great teachers I had there, um, focus was on like how to, you know, how you, how you can, uh, I don't want to say manipulate, but how you can control one's vision throughout a composition. And I don't think I'll ever forget that. And I think that one lesson came in really handy when I think about, you know, how I finish my work, like how I finish the pieces themselves with the surface techniques and how I present them in a space, what height they're at, you know, in relation to the human body. I think all of that comes from this understanding that when I was studying graphic design, it was about the hierarchy of information within a composition. And I still use that no matter what I'm working on, whether it's a performance video, painting, whatever, I still think about that concept. Yeah. Cool. Also, I just wanted to say, um, when you were talking about um, what like heat and fire means to you, like also someone working in ceramics, I feel like I had never thought about like fire or heat being like an agent of change before. So I just like wanted to say thank you. Yeah. For yeah, it really is. It, it really is. I mean, we, it totally changes it. And then also, like, 
like in the kiln you do like experience like a loss it's like the loss of whatever the the, the water and the clay yeah. and it just you experience that loss but the product is like strong and vitrified yeah and what does that mean right to experience loss and then all of a sudden be stronger than you were before that's like so beautiful like thank you for bringing that up yeah you're welcome yeah, that's, that is, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful analog, analogy, I think, for a lot of life experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a perfect way, a perfect way to end our conversation that I wish we could extend more, but I have a feeling I'll be talking to you quite soon. Yeah. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Anina Major, as always, for sharing with us your insight and your experiences and your work and that we definitely honor what you're doing and we support it and we look forward to talking to you again very soon. So thanks to everyone for joining us and um, this will be archived on our BCRC YouTube page. So for those of you that didn't get a chance to join us and those of you that wanna share it, it will be there for you to access. So join us in about two weeks, we'll do this all again and hopefully Anina will, um, will join us again in the future too. So. Talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take good care and be safe. Bye -bye. Be safe.